when you think about Gavin Wood, right, he's the CTO and co-founder of two of blockchain's biggest successes, Ethereum and Polkadot. I mean, every interview is about technology, obviously, uh, with him, but the impact is so profound of some of the innovations being done there that it's really lovely to be able to have a chance to chat with him and to learn a little bit more about Gavin and what motivates him and what led him to this vision. Now, the person uh, chatting with him is uh, Rob Schwartz, who uh, is general partner of Blockchain Ventures. And by the way, if you have a bold as vision as, as you know, some of the things that, that uh, Gavin has, he's the kind of investor that you go and see. Um, because he's really, Blockchain Ventures invest in some of the biggest, uh, such as Audius, Figure, Flow, Near, Polkadot, Solana. Please welcome Rob Schmaltz and Gavin Wood to the stage. Thanks, Eric. Um, so welcome, everybody, and uh, uh, thank you for being here, especially after having dealt with some illness. So really appreciate you uh, making the effort. Um, as, you know, as Eric said, uh, we're, um, we're really uh, lucky to have uh, Dr. Gavin Wood here. Um, if you think about sort of the foundational pieces of so much of the blockchain uh, today, uh, it's not only being built on top of Ethereum, uh, where Gavin was the co-founder and CTO, uh, but also on top of Polkadot, where, again, you were a co-founder. Gavin's also uh, the, I'm going to get this wrong, but the CEO of the Parity, of Parity and the president of the Web3 Foundation. Uh, Gavin actually coined the phrase Web3, so we also owe him a debt of gratitude for uh, providing what's increasingly become, the, I think, the intellectual construct that, that many uh, projects and teams are using uh, to drive forward the, the development of the blockchain. But uh, one of the things we wanted to do, as Eric alluded to, was dig in a little bit uh, to sort of get to uh, the man behind Dr. Gavin Wood and, and learn about some of his early influences. We are also going to talk, of course, about where the space is headed. And um, as we did yesterday, for those of you who uh, were here for my other panel, um, we're going to save some time for you to ask questions. So as before, we'll have mics uh, uh, in the audience, and uh, I'll, I'll be uh, looking to you uh, for, uh, for questions when, uh, when we're a little deeper into the session. You know, what I'd love to start off with, uh, I think um, people often find that there were sort of uh, foundational circumstances or experiences they had when they were younger that led them to be sort of who they are today. In my case, uh, my family moved around a lot. I can see how that's manifest in myself now. Are there circumstances or, or experiences like that that you can kind of see in your current self that were the seeds were planted when you were younger? It's really difficult to uh, analyze one's childhood and work out, like, you know, maybe there are particular, <laughs> particular elements. In my own, I'm not really sure. We, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a pretty small town. Um, and uh, I think maybe if I'd been moving around a lot, like, like you, I would have had a, a more, uh, more to draw upon. As it was, um, you know, age eight, I got given my, my first computer, a, a, not a very good one, but it was bought uh, from the bloke across the road for like 20 quid. And, um, and you know, it, it introduced me to, um, you know, to a much bigger world in, in some sense, you know, where, where at the time, I think I was like playing with Lego and, and yeah, this yeah. kind of thing, you know, and it's like, wow, I can build much more complicated things. Um, on, on this machine. Um, so I think, I think probably that's, that, you know, after that point, it, it, computers was it. Like, yeah. for, for me, it was, you know, uh, I learned many different languages. I, you know, obviously had many different computers, but, you know, that was always my primary focus. Yeah. Well, no, no, that's great, because I think a lot of kids were given Legos. Nothing wrong with Legos. Uh, no, great. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but a computer at age eight is probably uh, the gift that has continued to keep on giving, in a sense. What about people? Uh, sometimes, this isn't true for everyone, but some people really had a, either a friend or a group of friends or, or colleagues, colleagues is the wrong word when you're a kid, let's just call them friends, uh, friends when they were young that, again, sort of you know, led to kind of things, the evolution of the, themselves as a person. Or did you feel like you had a, a group of people that were formative around you or, or is that? Yeah, I mean, I was lucky enough to, um, uh, the town that I grew up in wasn't super far uh, from um, from a slightly bigger town, Lancaster, really nice place. I mean, if you happen to be in the northwest of England, recommend a visit. Um, and it, it, it happened to have a, a pretty decent school. Uh, so, age eleven, I went. I went to this school. I, you know, I managed to get in. And um, some of the people that I met at school, uh, I still, I still know today. You know, I still hang out. Um, indeed, uh, two of them are involved with the Web three Foundation. Oh, excellent. Um, 
So did I, they share a similar love of computers from an early age, or did you sort of pull them into Web three, or did you get there together? If that makes sense. Uh, I think for the Web three element, I you know I pulled them in mostly, um, but um, certainly from an early age, we were very you know technical and intellectually minded. Um, so and it wasn't just computers. Computers was for sure a part of it. In fact, one of these two people, I made um, I made my first uh, sort of published video game. Um, which was great, uh, very enjoyable time. I think we were about 13 or 14. Um, and and he, he handled all the, the graphics and I did the, the coding. Um, so it, it was really nice to be able to collaborate on some of these very early projects. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, as I say, it's not just about computers, but it's about thinking you know, um, as to how the world works in general. Um, and, and one of the other... Uh, friends was very much uh, got, got me thinking in that regard. Elements of philosophy, physics, sociology, you know, all, all these kinds so of different subjects that we can um, understand and systematize and sort of try to f model and figure out, you know. And this really folds into the computers because computers are really great ways of systematizing and modeling things. And, and really when this sort of, I mean, Web3 is maybe a, maybe a, a year or two after um, my original sort of dive into um, into sort of how society would be affected on a more on a more general level with uh, with computation, uh, but it really uh, it really did provide a really good basis for uh, thinking in those terms. Yeah, I'm really struck by the fact. I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, I can remember the early days of of Web two of the internet. Uh, by the way, th thank you for now making me feel like my. Uh, my prior career was just a lead up to, to, to Web3, but um, there, was a, there was a strong philosophical underpinning early on in the internet as well, which I, I think a lot of people don't even realize or, or recall. But I'm struck by the fact that you said that the friend group opened your eyes to philosophy. Your parents maybe opened your eyes to compu computation and computers, and then the friend group brought in philosophy. And, and, and certainly, I think we see the um, integration, if it's not too strong a word, of, of those two Threads really coming together in in things like Ethereum and Polkadot. There's there's a there's a strong philosophical piece to it as well as obviously a a, a very profound computational underlayer. So am I overanalyzing, or do you feel like that's a? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm willing to accept that I'm not a uh, psychoanalyst, so you can push back. But yeah, I, I would say bro broadly broadly in the right direction. Thank you. You're you're, you're, you're being kind. Um, well, you know, as you said, you got you got a computer at eight. You had your first published video game at thirteen. Um, so, uh, where did you, from 13 to uh, when you first started to um, uh, engage in the blockchain, tell me about that. A lot of people use this catchphrase, well, I, I read the Satoshi uh, uh, white paper and then I went down the wormhole and, and then that's it. Mm. It, it. You did a little more than that. Your, your wormhole at least was quite large given, given that you <laughs> co-founded Ethereum and Polkadot, Web3, et cetera. W what was it that got you into the space? Like when, when did the light bulb go off? and and what was it you said, oh my gosh, that's going to let me do X? Or was it just, ooh, this is interesting, I want to experiment? I think uh, to technologists, like really, you know, red-blooded technologists, disruption is the key thing, right? Um, we want our technology to make a difference. And um, yeah, I remember back in like 2011, there was a story on Slashdot, technology sort of uh, journal, um, that was, uh, you know, it was about Bitcoin, it was like, hey, look, there's this currency. Uh, it's like, okay, I took a look at it. I was kind of interested. I was thinking maybe I should buy some or something. Um, I, I took one like, look at MT Gox and was like, ah, no, too much effort. Um, then fast forward two years, there was another story, um, this time in the Guardian newspaper, I think. Um, and it was, it was uh, talking about Bitcoin. It had this interview with this guy, Amir Taki, who was one of the Bitcoin, he's not actually sort of, doesn't work on Bitcoin core per se, but he, he's sort of a developer involved with Bitcoin. Okay. He cut the figure of a, of a very, um, a bit of a sort of techno uh, revolutionary, you know, he, he sort of wore this hood. He, he looked like he'd been wearing the same clothes for like many months. <laughs> um, Probably had. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. And so, um, you know, but he was talking, he was in this squat, like whether you were interviewing him, he was looking over at the city of London, saying, you know, how Bitcoin was going to like uh, disrupt all, all the banking infrastructure, and it was, um, 
you know, it was quite an interesting proposition. So I figured, uh, and what was, what was very notable to me was that this guy was a coder. So it was, you know, at least The Guardian reckoned that he had a good chance of scoring some pretty substantial disruption. Around the same time, Silk Road was becoming a thing, and it was like, wow, look, Bitcoin, it's getting a bad rap, it's letting people do this and that and the other. Um, and, and again, it had this disruption air about it. And so, of course, uh, as a technologist, I was curious. It was like, what is technology facilitating here? And, uh, and how is it facilitating this? So um, I took a look at Bitcoin, and I, I, I still found it difficult to get into. It seemed like it was a very, um, a little cliquey. It looked like it had a power structure that was not the easiest to sort of um, come into. Um, and then, you know, I met a few people. I met Amir Taki. I met, he introduced me to a few of his friends. And through these friends, I met Vitalik. And um, around uh, like late November, December 2013, you know, Vitalik had this, uh, was, was sort of just pushing this, this initial white paper that he'd written. And um, I got hold of it, and it, it seemed like a, a pretty interesting, like, early stage um, uh, thing to get involved with. So I figured, you know, Vitalik wasn't really back then, um, you know, he wasn't really the guy that's going to code this up. Um, so he was looking for, um, for sort of partners that were going to help so him. He dusted off that, that eight year old computer and, uh, and fired it up again. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and then, as they say, the, the, the rest is history in quotes. Obviously, a lot of blood, blood, sweat, and tears along the way. You don't go around beating your chest, but, but I think uh, it would be, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's natural to be extremely proud of, of the contributions you've made uh, into the space, um, you know, between uh, Ethereum and Polkadot and, and Web3. What's given you sort of the most satisfaction from that, right? I mean, you've have these, released these, I mean, world-changing uh, um, uh, technologies uh, onto the world. When you look at them, is it, is it, what is it that you look and say, wow, you know, I, I helped do that, or I did that, or, or this is happening? Where do you get kind of the most satisfaction? It's, I think, still that childhood curiosity. Um, you know, it's very much the same uh, me that was back in the bedroom at age nine, you know, uh, yeah. banging away on this tiny little home computer from the 80s plugged into a portable TV. Um, and and the, the sheer fun of like um, wondering if what you're doing is going to work, and then the only way of testing it really is doing it. And so um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I would say if there's a single driving factor, it's curiosity. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, and and I, I think I've also heard you say that you, you've been just amazed by what, I mean, the, the beauty of both uh, Ethereum and Polkadot is they are in of themselves remarkable creations, but they also enable others to create further remarkable creations. And I, I think I've heard you talk about that before, um, of just the kind of seeing these things develop. Um, t tell me a little bit more, or tell our audience a little bit more about that. You know that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the the one issue, I, you know, curiosity drove me for a very long time. Um, I spent, you know, several years sort of off the off the grid, not really off the grid, but like, you know, meeting maybe up to five people a week, um, and uh, and otherwise just just coding, just building stuff, you know, um, building stuff that I was myself interested in, like for no other reason, and it keeps you going for a while, but eventually, you know, you, you gotta, you know, you wonder to yourself, you know, is is what I'm doing of any use, you know, after I'm gone, is anyone going to actually remember any? Is anyone going to feel that any of this stuff was? I think you're safe there, by the way. Anyway, keep, keep, keep going. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, and this is partly what drove me to get involved with, uh, you know, in the crypto industry. Um, it felt like uh, there was a marriage, there could be a marriage here between curiosity and actually um, helping people, like giving, finding users, finding people that actually wanted to build on what I was, what I was making. And obviously, um, or maybe it's not obvious, but I think there's a, Somehow, if you can relate more to the people that are using what it is that you're doing, it feels it feels better. You get more of a buzz, yeah. you know. And um, and so for me, being a builder, it, it's 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 like it generates more internal happiness to see other builders using it, building on it. So um, you know, more so than like, hey, wow, a bunch of people instead of paying with Visa or Mastercard paid with Bitcoin yeah. or Ethereum. Yeah. That's not. That's not, you know, because I don't, I don't have so much, um, so much empathy with, yeah. with that. But, but it's those second order effects where you're seeing all these new, I mean, because Ethereum, Polkadot, transformational, and yet we're seeing 
more transformation coming on top of that. And that's that building, that compounding of building, if you will. Yeah. Uh, no, that's that's uh, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna look to you guys in just one one uh, one minute. I'm gonna ask uh, G- uh, Gavin another question, and then I'll then I'll uh, get your uh, get the audience involved. Um, so, Parachains recently launched. Congratulations! That's very exciting. Uh, huge development uh, for the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, I'm not asking you to make a prediction because that's always a, a, a risky bet, particularly in front of an audience, uh, many of whom are investors. Um, but what do you want to see next for for Polkadot and, and maybe even more broadly for for the space as a whole? Like what what's your, that curiosity um, and builder uh, in you? What 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 is he hoping to see? Uh, you know, in, on the go forward. I think you know it's going to fall into two sort of facets here. One of them is you know we started these organizations, Parity Web Three Foundation, um, and uh, you know with the project having been having been delivered to the uh, you know, to, to what was sort of put out back in all so long ago in uh, in 2016, when I put out the polka dot uh, paper. I feel that the project's now moving on to, you know, beyond that first, we have to get the crowd loan done and dusted phase. It's like, yep, we delivered on that. Okay, thumbs up, tick box, sorted. Um, so now we're moving on to the phase where we actually have a little bit more latitude in where we can where we can go with this, what we can do with this. Um, and this is going to, uh, you know, like I say, there's a bunch of facets here. One of them is that we can start building things on top of Polkadot. Um, another thing is that we can move on to looking at um, the technologies beyond what I would call Polkadot 1, which was what I put forward, which is, what, seven years? I mean, six, seven years ago now, into what looks, uh, what does Polkadot 2 look like? What's the next generation ah. beyond this? And for that, we have a lot of ideas. So we've uh, and this falls into the sort of third facet, which is the organizations. How are we going to move these, these organizations forward? And this is partly you know, professionalization. So this started last year with uh, hiring Bertrand Perez into the COO position of the foundation. But we also have a sort of wave of professionalization coming into parity as well. And this really is to um, uh, ensure that we make maximum use of the resources that we have, um, but also to ensure that we can grow the companies um, uh, that we can grow them well into the coming years to be able to sort of deliver on um, or, or, you know, utilize the position that we're in as, as a jumping off point as much as possible. So really push forward into um, what I would loosely term Polkadot 2. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm excited to, to learn more about that as, a, as it unfolds. We've only got a little bit left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, again, invoke my moderator's privilege and ask you a, a final question, um, but I'm, I'm going to do it on behalf of the audience. What would be the one thing you'd want them to take away from, from today or, or just from your own views on kind of where, where things are headed? I'd say in terms of the, if we liken crypto to the internet, I'd say we're still sort of uh, 93 to 95 era. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe we're at the Usenet um, and, and email, the well. right? <laughs> uh, we're still, there's still a lot more to go. Um, and I think much even of, of the sort of web one, um, is still to be discovered. I think the sort of equivalents of, of Google and possibly even like Alta Vista have yet to come along. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would, uh, for long-term commitment, look towards projects that are really uh, taking a much more... Um, they're not trying to necessarily solve for the, um, uh, the solutions of today, be, be they what they may, uh, but really looking forward um, and building a uh, platform that can, on which you know the the, the sort of um, the products of tomorrow can be built. Fantastic, that's good. That's great, great advice. Well, I uh, I like to thank you both for making the effort because I know um, you know it's especially tough when when you've been under the weather. But also thank you for uh, a lot of great uh, sharing and advice. And so please join me in thanking Dr. Gavin Wood for uh, his time today. So. Thank you, Rob.